the last, uh, but possibly not. Uh, virtual art and business brunch. Uh, normally, for the last uh, four years, this has been a breakfast uh, at the museum. Uh, we hold it every uh, four months. It's been a fabulous experience for the community to get the artists community and the business community together to hopefully find some uh, common denominators. And some of those projects are starting to show some fruit in the community. So really pleased that the, the project is doing exactly what we wanted to do. Um, today we've gathered together uh, six artists from around the nation. Um, we'll introduce them a little later. Um, I'm going to make a couple of comments and get us kind of uh, primed for a conversation about artists as entrepreneurs. Artists are preeminent finders, rehabilitators, and occupiers of inexpensive, often abandoned buildings. That is why we, we have Soho and Chelsea and Bushwick and more in New York and in Los Angeles, Venice, Culver City, and Boyle Heights. And there are similar places and for the same reasons in rural and urban uh, areas all over the world. In 2012, Superstorm Sandy, no relation, uh, bashed, flooded, decimated, and killed. It was huge, 1,000 miles in diameter, slow. It stayed for two days, constant rain. It was windy. It was 90 miles an hour for the whole stay. It was badly timed. It arrived at an 11-foot high tide. It was cold. It brought snow as well as rain. And it was backwards because it got stronger as it went inland. Um, and it was urban and coastal, uh, invading New York City's rivers, inlets, harbors, subways, tunnels, sewers, streets, and basements, and first floors of some of the city's uh, most vulnerable, low-lying, sometimes subterranean real estate. For all these consequences, Superstorm Sandy inflicted inordinate per capita damage on artists. One of those artists, after the storm had left, returned to his East River home to find the first floor awash in floating and mangled debris. Most of it is furniture and other possessions, now battered, shredded by the rampaging floodwaters. His living room had become a veritable washing machine. But what was his first response? What can I make with this stuff? That to me is about as entrepreneurial as you get. So, what is an artist? One day is in their creativity to make work that resonates with themselves and others. And what is an entrepreneur? One definition is someone who organizes, manages, and assumes the risks of a business or enterprise. This morning, we're going to have a conversation between six local, regional, and national artists about Artists is entrepreneurs. They include Athena Latoka from Peekskill, New York, by way of Anchorage, Alaska. Ellen Diedrich, who lives in Fargo, North Dakota, by way of Wyzetta, Minnesota. Falcon God, who now lives in Moorhead, by way of Canada. Pastor Madunde, who lives in Moorhead, Minnesota, by way of Rwanda. Steve Revlin, now living in Fargo and having lived in Fargo for his entire life. And Sue Leggett, living in Moorhead, also by way of Moorhead. Before we start, I'd like each of the artists uh, to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about who they are, what they do, uh, where they're going. And we'll start with Athena. My name's Athena Latoka. I'm currently living in Peekskill, but um, I have studios in both here in Peekskill and down in, um, I have a residency right now in the World Trade Center in Manhattan. And um, I'm a visual artist. Uh, my principal materials are, um, for the past 10 years, ink wash, um, earth, uh, organic material that I add into the layers. And I often work, uh, from very small to large scale. Sue. My name is Sue Leggett. I am a community engagement and social practice artist with a background in photography and installation work. 
Um, I primarily focus on uh, cultural exchanges and um, in particular rural Minnesota culture um, with a particular focus on the idea of engaging and inciting empathy. Pastor. Hi, my name is Pastor Mudende. Um, I was born in Rwanda and I'm a happy transplant to the Fago Mohead uh, community area. Um, my main practice in art, I work mainly with oil paint um, and uh, I do work for the Plain Dutch Museum as a social engagement and community liaison. Ellen. Hi, I'm Ellen Diedrich and I'm from Fargo, North Dakota. And I have been um, painting since I was a kid and I do acrylic and watercolor. And I have a line of note cards, chiclet reproductions and books. And I'm very busy all the time. <laughs> Steve. I'm Steve Raveland, uh, born and raised in, uh, in Fargo. I've uh, been an artist uh, and musician for 60 years, 60 as a musician and 50 as a furniture maker. After high school in 1971, I started my first furniture business and I specialize in exotic, funky tables and chairs. Falcon. Good morning. Um, my name is Falcon Gott. It's my legitimate name. It's not a nickname. It's not anything outside of that. <laughs> um, I, I mainly work in um, digital filmmaking. Um, my main type of uh, thing that I would like to, that I do explore is um, Native American cinema and how to represent Native Americans in a light that isn't stereotypical. And outside of that, I also do landscape photography and I dabble in painting and sketching. So I'm going to add some uh, little footnotes. Um, Falcon is also one hell of a rollerblader. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Sue has worked with the museum in the past on our Defiant Garden, Heritage Garden and Amphitheater project in Moorhead. Uh, which has been amply uh, rewarded with funding from a number of national uh, foundations. Uh, Pasteur has been a teaching artist at the museum, uh, as well as a curator of a recently uh, just uh, uninstalled exhibition called Be Exist. Uh, Athena was in residency at the museum uh, for a week, I think. Um, wow. Did an, an amazing project, I don't know, how tall was it? 15 feet tall and 100 feet long? It was, I'm close, nine, nine feet tall and 60 feet long. Um, mural, um, which is now in our collection, is that right, Andy Mouse, our director and CEO? It is in our collection. Um, she, uh, she, and she was here for a month uh, producing that, that amazing work on, on site. And Ellen's been a supporter, along with her family, of the museum for a long time. Um, and as Steve, we're kind of trying to get him back re-involved, and this is one of the things we thought we could do. And he has been involved a little bit with the museum, but we're going to try to get him even in, even deeper into the into the museum's works. So, um, before we get started, there are three people I really want to uh, thank for getting this project off the ground. Uh, Savannah Schultz, uh, who is our executive and development coordinator, who put together all of the tech stuff that we're taking advantage of today. Sarah Anstep, who is our development and marketing manager, who did all of the PR for this, this project. And Cody Jacobson, who's not on, uh, on the call, but uh, he may be listening in. But Cody uh, did all the graphics for us and did one heck of a job of giving us uh, uh, out there through social media. So without any further ado, the first question, um, when did you realize you needed to be an entrepreneur to support yourself as an artist? I'll just throw it out there. Let somebody answer. I'm, I'm going to let Sue answer because that was her question. I don't think there's ever a moment when that's not part of the equation. <laughs> For an artist. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got 
um, from one of the Gorilla Girls actually was um, the best you can hope for is that you have two jobs, one that feeds your face and one that feeds your soul. Um, and if you're really lucky, they're both in the art world. So maybe you're a teacher and a practicing artist. Maybe you are a um, curator and a practicing artist. Maybe you're a printer and a practicing artist, but there's always one that's gonna pay the bills so that you can be a practicing artist. Um, it, it's just a challenge of striking a balance so that one allows you the time to do the other. But it's never been, um, even, even the people I know who would be considered top tier or those who have made it, they're still lecturing, they're still teaching, they're still, um, to, you know, doing workshops, they're still out there working. They're not just in their studio producing and selling work. Elkin, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> when did you realize you needed to be an entrepreneur to support yourself as an artist? Um, like, that's a really good question. Um, I think it just happened. I didn't really have like a specific, like I was like, I'm gonna get paid for what I wanna do. I just had a love for like, a love and a high interest for filmmaking. And then through the Native Arts Program, through the Plains Art Museum, um, that was like one of the first times that, uh, at the time Laura Youngbird, she was like, yeah, we'll pay you for your work. And I was like, oh, so this is where the ball is gonna start rolling. So I might as well like, you know, uh, catch up on that and, and so that's when it happened and that was a number of years ago I think in late 2015 or early 2016 and so since then um it's just been kind of um I've been you know getting paid for my work which is you know essential um but uh yeah I, didn't, I never really thought about it it just kind of happened and <laughs> I jumped on it yeah um Falcon was an intern at the museum through our create creativity for among native uh, native artists program. Pastor, what about you? Yeah, uh, for me, um, I was actually thinking about it when you asked a question and, uh, and I can I can almost pinpoint to a particular time. Um, it was in 2008. Uh, I was uh, at the time I was uh, I had just moved uh, to New York City. Perfect time to move to New York City in 2008. Um, and uh, I did not, I did not have, I couldn't find a job. I couldn't. I worked as a bartender. I got laid off, and I remember all the time. Like the only thing that kept on coming into my mind was like, "Dude, you are not it. Make a painting, sell it. That's all." And I did. I tried. I made like ten paintings. I sold one. <laughs> I still have the rest. Uh, but I, I do feel like that's how um, I started uh, uh, valuing or thinking about ways I can use um, my creativity um, to make uh, income out of something. You, you also have another business. Yes, I, I do. Um, I, I have a business called uh, Chaimoto. Uh, and uh, all that is in Swahili, chai, which is a multinational word for tea, and moto is Swahili for heart or fire, so it's called hot tea. Uh, so I blend uh, different types of tea and uh, sell them at the farmer's market. Um, the business was really inspired by the uh, idea of introducing uh, culture and art to the community uh, in a way that that uh, it's not really that as an art, so it's not even that as a culture. Because I do believe that if you want to invite people into your life to, if you want people to humanize who you are, to tell your story, um, if you give them food and art, that's one way to do it very, uh, very easily. Uh, and so with, with Chai, most of the tea blends that I made were really inspired by the uh, types of teas and herbs that uh, I grew up uh, having in Africa or some that are really dominant in some cultures in Africa. So say like if you are in South Africa, you have a lot of uh, rooibos tea. 
So I would blend it to the different hubs and uh, and serve that and kind of tell the story of Roy Boy C from South Africa and so on and so forth. Steve, when did you know? Well, I think I, uh, I knew I wanted to be an artist in the mid 60s. As far as uh, being an entrepreneur it was probably 1971. Uh, when I realized the, uh, my choice of being a woodworker required purchasing tools, having a shop. And um, I, I can't say that the first five years were, were, you know, were any picnic, but we had no, we had no World Wide Web. We had no social media. Uh, it just required a lot of uh, phone calls uh, to get going and latching on to some interior designers. And uh, it was a very slow process, very long journey. But uh, yeah, it was, I'd say right out of high school, 71. Ellen. Well, I uh, made money in high school on art as my grandma bought um, my paintings. And, and she said, well, she said, uh, Alan, I want you to know the only reason I'm buying this painting is to encourage you. Um, so that was real flattering. But I did in um, 1980 get um, asked to resign from my nursing home job. And they recommended that I do something that was more suitable to my personality. And so I decided I had taken a portrait drawing class and I started drawing portraits. And I put myself through the last three years of college doing that. And um, I learned a lot about business and being there, just going every day to work and having the discipline to do that. If I didn't go, I wouldn't make any money. Some days I wouldn't make any money and other days I'd make a lot. And um, so my friends would tell me, you're not an artist, you know, when you're doing this. But however, it was really helpful for my drawing skills and that kind of thing, and it was related, and it kind of gave me a foothold into getting other jobs. Athena. Oh, um, I feel like I kind of came late to the game. And um, when I was in school, I mean, it, it, that, that part was always a mystery for me. How do, how do you be an entrepreneur and be a studio artist? And when I was in school, they really didn't, teach us how to be an entrepreneur. There were no classes in business. So we we're always taught just be in your studio, do your work and get a job, whatever you need to do to support yourself. Cause you know, you're, you might not make it, you might not, you know, you just, you're gonna have to find your own way through. You know, so that's pretty much what I, been doing and I never really thought about that word entrepreneur alongside being an artist until really the last six years and that was going up to Alana the house at um, Frederick Church's house at Alana and the docents there were really well um, versed in church's life and explaining how he was a businessman and how he was a really good businessman. And he, church built the house at Atlanta later in his life and he rarely painted there. Um, so, you know, so, I never, so for me, it was really a lot about, you know, again, it was a huge mystery for me. Um, and it was just whatever you needed to do to support your work, whatever job. Um, and through the years, it was getting to know various artists and then working in museums and working in galleries and um, working with artists in their studios and just learning how they're doing, making their way through and maybe teaching, you know, access to resources and staying close to the field. Um, so it's been a lot of self-funding through the years, a lot of debt. And so how have you um, thrived uh, in the last five years or six years um, with the advent of social media? Have you utilized it in your practice? 
about myself? Well, a lot of that. Anybody. Was, well, of course, it's um, having a web presence, um, a place to go where people can see maybe your recent body of work um, and sharing that with uh, the global community. I have sort of like three veins to my world. One is my business where I do the fine art printing and photo restoration. Then I have my uh, personal practice, which is photography and just, you know, producing these images and selling them on my website. And then I have the community engagement and social practice, which is event-based. And crowdsourcing and things like that, which necessarily a physical output that can be sold. Um, so how I use social media is different for each one of those veins, right? Um, so it's great in terms of like, you know, advertising, and then you have the website for sales, and then you have, you know, social media that you can use for crowdsourcing, where you post a question or a prompt, and you can use the feedback on that to feed your work and um, take it to a next level or decide which direction you want to go with it. And um, so it's been, it's been absolutely invaluable for me in those different categories. Ellen? Well, the social media has been very helpful. I used to do print all my ads and mail them out and I started as a mail order business. And now um, it's so much more economical to use the social media. So I, I have a blog, which has been probably my best thing I've done where I have painting of the week every week. I invite people to look it up, it over anyhow, it's, um, I talk about the story of a painting and then I tell maybe an art tip. I am an art instructor and I feed my workshops with this and um, my, it links to my website so they can click on stuff. Generally, nobody buys the thing that I'm promoting. They always buy something else if they're gonna buy. Um, but yes, being able to send pictures to customers I have spent a ton of money on photography. Um, I've been photographing all my originals for years. And so I have this humongous um, pile of images and I can just grab one and pick on it and use it every week. So that's been really worthwhile now. And so I find it very helpful. Steve, because you, you, you mentioned earlier that you, know, you started when nobody had any clue what the internet was right well i you know i'd have to say that uh, well 10 years ago i uh, i told my wife i said look i'm i'm gonna i'm not gonna do custom work anymore i'm gonna you know social uh, facebook came out and uh i thought gosh this is this this could really work um so i told my wife i'm just gonna uh, i'm gonna build an art gallery i'm just gonna make tables and chairs and I'm going to use social media. And, you know, being 68 years old, I'm probably in the best earning years of my life right now when the majority of my friends who aren't artists are retiring. And it's because of Facebook. I'd say 25% of all of my tables and chairs get sold on Facebook before they make it to the gallery because it, interactive I can tell stories the key is getting followers and getting friends you know and, the, and then and then being active and not overactive but enough to where uh, you can utilize it and it's 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 next to being free so it's for me it's it's been a boon so Falcon you're kind of new to all of this <laughs> very much so uh, um, so social media is interesting. Um, there are so many different platforms out there that can adhere to like what you know what you would like to convey about your your your, your mediums or your, your pieces. Um, for me, I I only use Instagram, and then I share that to my Facebook page, and so um, that has been very you know quite helpful or um, and useful because you. You know, you, you can constantly share work. 
and through sharing work, um, you know, people see it, people comment it. Um, and, you know, usually it's like, oh, like, do you sell prints or do you, um, what's available for, for this or like, you know, pricing and all that. So it's very like, um, it's very like helpful to connect with those people and your, and your audience. And it's instantaneous. It's like you, you receive a message, you receive a comment and you just text away and then boom. It's like, you know, you already set up something for, for selling a piece. And it's always appreciative, appreciative when your customer shares the work that they just bought on their account. So it kind of like grows as time grows on. That's how I that's how I've noticed it over the past couple of years. Yeah. No, no worries. Pastor, how are you using social media? And are are um, you better off with it today than you were when you started? Uh, well, um, so when I started uh, on my, with my tea business, when I started with social media, I started with so much energy, and I was creating this really, really beautiful, cute photography of my tea leaves and stuff. I uh, put them on Instagram. It was really amazing. And I would write a small a short story about it. But then I came, I came to realize how much work goes into it because social media moves so fast. You have to be, like every day pretty much have to produce something if you want to stay relevant on social media. Um, you want to be up there interacting with people 24-7 all the time. So it's a lot of work uh, with social media. Uh, social media like that but but then again you connect with a lot of people too at the same time um and then uh also in my art practice i haven't really used social media in my art practice because when i make a painting i work with oil paint um it takes me a while to feel to be satisfied with one painting and it takes me a while to feel like okay this is good enough for me to put it uh to public out there however uh, I keep getting, uh, I keep getting tagged with uh, some of my paintings from previous people who have purchased them or who have moved to them, and that's really has been a really really good feeling to kind of um, either like revisit something that I parted with, you know, five years ago and see it again that it still exists somewhere, and it's been wonderful. So, what are one of the major failures or major choices. Um, what did you do and how did you, what did you learn from it? Oh, I got a good one for this. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see, I think it was in January or it was either November of last year or early January of this year where um, I had a screening for a, a uh, documentary I made um, locally about missing and murdered indigenous women. And so it was kind of about, you know, the over the general idea of what this um, issue is about and some of the key people, um, key native women that are um, bringing awareness to, to this issue in the community. And so I'm editing away, I'm editing away. And all of a sudden my uh, computer just like shuts off. And I was like, oh, it's, it's, I was probably overheating or just like, you know, something just being running. And so I turn it back on and I open up the editing software and um, like 50% of my project has gone missing. Um, well, actually all of it has got, had gone missing. And um, that was kind of like a, an adrenaline field moment because I was like, oh, this is kind of due in a couple of days. And, uh, <laughs> and so I ended up just like looking for um, uh, backup files and I was able to retrieve 50% of what I was, uh, uh, what I had done. And, um, and, but it was, the project was never what it was before uh, my computer crashed. And what I learned from that was, is um, <laughs> take a break. Don't constantly edit and edit and edit and edit and edit, because I think that's what was the, the issue to um, my computer crashing, you know, just, because I can edit for hours. I can just like tune in and just like chug away and be invested in it so much. But um, 
but then again, you know, from this crash, um, I need to pull myself away from it and kind of like let my computer rest, let myself rest and come back with it with like, uh, kind of like with fresh eyes. And, um, you know, hopefully with that tactic, which I've been utilizing since then, um, and I haven't had any issues with a computer crashing. Um, hopefully with that tactic, um, I won't have such a severe uh, <laughs> injury to one of my projects in the future. For those of us who know Falcon, we, we know that he edits and edits and edits and edits. So not surprising. Pastor, what's something you, what was a major failure or challenge for you? What did you learn? Oh, um, I have so many failures. I, I don't know if I can list them all, but I do believe one of them is um, as, as an artist, and especially I do feel as an upcoming artist in this community, um, I do feel this weight or some sort of responsibility of saying yes to everything, right? So somebody says, hey, can you, can we do this? Can we work with you here? I can work with you. I'm like, yes, let's do it. Yes, 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 yes. And then obviously I don't make it sometimes. And now I've created maybe uh, a different or not so wonderful image about, about me or my character or my working capabilities. And so I've probably, and I'm still learning how to, to really, uh, to really pick what I'm going to do and set aside some things that I can say, hey, I don't have time for this right now, but I look forward to working with you in that in different capacity probably in the future. Um, in my business, uh, tea business, because that's really the joy of it is interacting with people and selling things, you know, uh, I love that, I love the aspect. But I've had, and I'm still, I'm still, I still get a lot of challenges, but I do believe my my challenges in the team business was to always always not be creative but understanding what people want because i i have different tastes i'm an artist i create something i create different blend i'm very happy sometimes at the time i created a blend of tea that was uh was supposed to be a black black mother tea <laughs> um because it was a Black, black tea, some dark chocolate, some black cardamom, and I can't remember what else I added. It was supposed to be black, black, black. It was terrible. But I tried to sell to people, but it, was, it just didn't work out. And But that's the beauty of it is that the idea of at least uh, letting, understanding that sometimes things are not going to work and being willing to fail and fail again and hopefully move forward. Ellen, what about you? Um, one of the most difficult problems I've had was I had a huge fear of the website. I, I've had three websites and the first one worked right away, but I got all, all this huge promotion and it wasn't really ready. So then, um, I, the second one, I got this guy and I swear we were playing mind games cause it was like. I would ask him to do something and it would never get done and it didn't work and it got to be like 44 seconds to turn it on and then 44 seconds to turn a page and then a pack of my at the end there I had my husband try to buy a pack of my my bison cards and they were 995 and he rang it up and it came up for 1795 to be shipped to his to Fargo and um Everything was all over and it was because partly because I wasn't really investing my effort into getting to understand it. That was part but I think visual artists, everybody has some thing, some horror story where the work fell off the wall in the middle of a show or something like that. So 
um, my moment was um, I had a grant that um, where I was working with several different youth groups and um, it was fairly open-ended. So there was money set aside for travel, money set aside for the exhibition, money set aside for supplies to make the work, but it was open-ended as to what we were going to actually produce because it was very collaborative. And when we started coming towards the end of the project, which was very successful, everything went great. Um, I ended up being higher on transportation and I had spent less money on supplies than what I had allocated. And I put in a grant request to shift the funds from one column to the other. And the agency denied my request and simply went through and took the lowest number from every column, whether it was what I had originally applied for or what I had ended up spending. And then they reissued my grant. Um, and when they reissued my grant, it was substantially less than what I was originally awarded, even though they had already issued my taxes for what I had originally been awarded. So I had to completely redo my taxes for the previous year. Um, and it created this huge problem for me. And from that, I learned spend the money. And I even asked the executive director of the, in, of the, the granting agency, what should I do in the future? Like, do you honest, are you honestly telling me I should just go out and buy myself a new lens for my camera and just come up with a reason for spending this money? And she's like, yep. yep. Even if you don't actually use it, it's like just spend the money. And I was like, this is the most backwards logic. Like it doesn't even benefit the project, but you spend the money. So that's what I learned. If you have the money, spend the money. Steve? You know, I'd say the uh, the fire was lit uh, underneath me uh, from Woodshop in high school, 1969 and 1970. And that, I went out and just bought some books on building, uh, building tables. Because uh, I didn't go to school for this, but I, but I also discovered uh, Wendell Castle and, and Frank Lloyd Wright. And so they were a huge was a huge inspiration for me. But early on, early 70s, mid 70s, uh, what I did not realize was that wood can do funny things, as, you know, especially in the, um, in the northern climate here with expansion and contraction and, and humidity and, and, and dryness in the winter. So early on, I would get these phone calls from clients uh, Mr. Reveland, um, the, uh, the table is cracking. So I would get these phone calls and, you know, I could have, I, 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 there probably were 10 different times I, I, would, I could have quit. And I'm, I'm glad I didn't. But I, I learned early on that you've got to learn all, all of the, uh, the, the qualities of all these different species of woods because they all expand and contract differently. You got to make sure that you get kiln dried wood and you can't use air dried wood or you're, you're going to ask for trouble. So, so early on, I, I learned those things. And then once I figured that out, it was kind of smooth sailing. Athena, what's, what's been a major failure or obstacle or challenge and what did you learn from it? Well, first I have to say that I, you know, I feel like, we always make fail, there's always failures in everything. Um, and there's always something to be learned through the process. Um, but just, you know, and it was, you know, I was really identifying with a lot of what Pasteur was saying um, about overbooking and learning about scheduling. And, and sometimes you just have to take that risk though and, and say, yes, yes, yes. Um, and because I think it's important to challenge ourselves and what our capabilities are and what we think we can do. Because a lot of times we can do more than what we think we can do. Um, so I think that's important and being open and willing to fail. So, you know, thank you, Pastor, for reminding us of all of that. <laughs> um, but one of the, one of the, the biggest um, challenges I've had and still have now is, um, is making sure to, I had left probably about 10, 12 paintings with, on consignment with a gallerist and, and 
um, I hadn't been in contact with him for probably six months. And I was checking in with him to see how things were going and no response. Um, so I looked him up, he had closed the gallery and had opened up something, a, a cafe around the corner. So I went, you know, around the corner and looked, you know, found him. And he said at the time, he goes, well, I have your work. Do you want it back? And I said, well, you know, he said he also had a number of um, deposits on a few of the pieces too. Um, and I said, well, after hearing that, I thought, well, maybe he's selling them. Maybe it's a good thing. And um, Then he disappeared again. And so I never, and I can't find him. And he's been in London, he's been around, um, and then back in New York, he's disappeared and has been. So, you know, I lost artwork through him. And these were some of the last um, oil paintings that I made prior to switching gears over to the uh, ink washes. So um, I, I would say that that was one of my biggest failures is not, not following up all the time with people who have work on consignment um, how important it is to stay in communication with them and to hold people accountable for what they're holding, um, what they have on deposit. Um, and apparently he has done this with a number, you know, and the fact is he's disappeared. You have a, you, I have a document that says these are the works that I had on consignment with you. But what good does that do? You know, he's disappeared. Um, and so I hope maybe someday, you know, he'll reach back out. I don't know if he's selling these to earn, you know, his way through life, you know, <laughs> like so what, you know, but, um, but I would say, I mean, that was one of the biggest failures that I've encountered so far. And it resulted in, you know, a loss of significant work that I, you know, that I entrusted to him. Um, and work, I probably, it, it's gone. It's gone. So, what has what has COVID taught us or you um, about connectivity and relationship building um, within the arts community at this time? Sue? Well, I do a lot of work um, in the rural communities or a lot of my work focuses on the rural relationship and especially that rural urban divide um, and the rural urban divide, I mean, we see it a lot, especially in uh, presidential election years, especially in 2016. Um, but COVID, I think, in particular, brought to light in the arts community this notion of um, the influence of the institution on the artist and the expectation of the artist to physically attend or physically go to the institution. Um, and for the rural artist or for the artist, that distance is often, um, it's too much. It's a burden. It's unaccessible for a lot of people. Um, so in some ways, COVID is a bit of a blessing where suddenly everybody's on Zoom. And it's a very, um, easy way to bridge that gap. It kind of leveled the playing field. And in a lot of ways, when the institutions closed, when we went into um, lockdown back last spring and the institutions closed, in the urban communities, a lot of people were freaking out because they couldn't go to these major institutions. And in the rural communities, they were like, yep, that's the way it is you don't have this readily available every single day. This is the way it is. Um, we, don't, we don't get to go to a major event any particular day of the week, you know? Maybe you get to go once a month if you're lucky. Um, I think it's a little bit different for those of us living in the Fargo-Moorhead area. We have the Rourke and we have the Plains and we have the Yomcoms and we have a couple other larger institutions so we have a sampling of things that are happening every month, as opposed to like the Twin Cities um, or really like New York, for example, where there's 
a multitude. But the point is, is, you know, in the rural communities, there's a blessing and a curse to not having institution readily available. And I think COVID shined a light on that um, and really um, accentuated what it's like to be a rural citizen and in particular a rural artist, um, not having information readily available, not having opportunities right around the corner physically from you. Um, I would like to say that that is turning into a conversation with the institutions and the agencies and the organizations that have that power. Um, I think it is in some ways. I don't know what's gonna come of that. Um, and I don't know how that could be addressed to benefit the um, underrepresented. Um, but I, I hope, I hope that, I hope that something will come of that. Well, we, we happen to have a director and CEO of the Plains Art Museum with us and Andy Mouse. Andy, you want to respond to that? It's been something we've worked on, you and I have worked on, you particularly. Um, you know, you're, you're a North Dakotan and uh, spent your, almost your entire life in, in rural communities. And now you're running a major, um, well, the major uh, art institution be, between Minneapolis and we think Seattle. But um, So what, you, what do you think about that disconnect? She's, she's uh, Sue, it, interestingly, talking a little bit about issues that we're about to explore in a big exhibition, which Athena, by the way, your mural is going to be reinstalled in a new context in a called High Visibility, um, which explores contemporary work in rural spaces um, that is um, authentically engaged in conversations around that location, right? Um, so we, we actually preface the show by talking about the urban rural divide, especially in an election year that becomes this, you know, this thing that is both on everyone's mind, but is also the most reductive, right? Like we're all just talking about politics instead of talking about lived experience, which is what Sue's talking about. And that's what artists are doing is um, delving into the realities and the complexities of lived experience, um, not, you know, the reductive nature of partisan politics. So. I think that's I think that's really um, interesting. I think there's a big um, arts access gap too that Sue mentioned um, that is exaggerated in places like North Dakota. So I'm I'm originally from Western North Dakota, from a rural space um, where you know it's as close to Minneapolis, it's as close to Denver as it is to Minneapolis if you're in Western North Dakota, right? So that's your nearest major metros are like. I don't know, 12, 12 hours away or something. And we talk in terms of hours in, in uh, Western North Dakota, not in miles. So <laughs> it's like, it's this, um, this pretty major um, arts access gap that exists across the United States. And I agree with Sue in the sense that um, technology can be an equalizer in this sense. Um, artists of a variety of different, and institutions of a, of a variety of different um, budgets or, um, um, or um, connections can produce similar quality content. So there's a, there's a really interesting equalizing effect that is happening, which I think is, is maybe, a, maybe if there's a silver lining to COVID, it might be it. So I'm gonna kind of flip it a little bit further, you know, back to the, the business side of things. You know, how do artists, how do you value uh, your work, place a value on it, a price? Um, you know, what determines that pricing? Is it low or market status or your status as an artist? Pastor, that was that was something you were interested in. You want to comment on it? Yeah, actually, that was a that was a question or a question that I've been struggling with for for a long time um, because my my technique or my way of pricing my my artwork is um, is based on uh on calculating the price per square inch and then i'll just give you that because i felt like that's fair for anybody um between the artist and the person who's purchasing the, the artwork but sometimes i tend to um to lower my prices just probably you know in hopes that yeah let me sell this because you're an artist and you need money you know all this um, but I do, 
one thing I've come to realize though is that art is like wine, you know, it gets better with age. It's going, you, when you look at, when I look at some of the past works that I've sold for like $200, I just want to punch myself in the face. I'm like, why did I do that? You know, because it just looks so amazing. I'm like, I don't even remember I could do that. Um, but also, but also, but something that I've been either struggling with and trying to figure out which, which we, uh, will be the best way um, for an artist to do this because um, speaking in a business sense, oh, and from a, if I try to put, maybe to put my business hat on, um, it would be very, how do you, or maybe how do you justify to a potential customer, client, who bought something from me uh, three years ago for two hundred dollars, and then they almost the same thing, and now it's a thousand dollars. And so I really don't have an answer to that, but I just uh, actually I'd like to hear a lot of uh, some of your input uh, about that. Steve, you're not in your head. Well, you know, I've got something that I utilize, and I, I make on average one piece, one table or chairs per week, fifty a year. So I know how much I'm making per hour. But you still, uh, you know, having done this for 50 years, you know, you kind of you have the luxury of, of pricing uh, for what the market will bear. And, you know, I make a piece uh, one week and the next week make another piece that kind of blows me away, you know, and I'll, I'll post it on and I'll, I'll get response from people on Instagram and social media. And that's kind of how I, you know, we as artists, we, you know, we, we shouldn't, uh, you know, when people come in the gallery and try to talk, talk the price down on something, I, I get so angry, you know, and, and we, um, you know, in a, I have a, a pat answer that I usually will tell them, you know, but um, we need to make a living. And um, so I will price at what the market will bear. And then if it doesn't sell, I'll mark it down. But I'll bring it into the gallery knowing um, in, in the last six years, I've made 300 and some pieces and they've, they've all sold. So, and some have been sold at, at a discounted price, but I discounted it. I didn't have someone say to me, well, will you take this much for it? That makes me uh, livid. So, um, you know, having done this for a long time, it, it makes a difference. And I, I know Ellen can, can, uh, can probably chime in on this as well, but um, I'm just really having the time of my life right now. And I think I'm just kind of getting going almost really. So that's how I price things. Ellen, what are your thoughts on that? I do price by the square inch. A customer, if they come in, they have an idea what they're looking for. So they want a piece this size and this color or whatever, and they come look, and I either have it or I don't have it. But um, if they were to be, let's say I thought something was really good and I wanted to add to it and charge more, and they came in, expecting to buy this for this price they would be freaked out and leave so i have this standard sizing thing and i average it out because some pieces are, are going to be just so much more than more superior to others in in a way you know there's a range my big thing is that i i don't raise my prices until i'm too busy so like right now i'm pretty really just horrendously busy i don't know so if I think I can't keep up and I'm rushing my work, that means I'm not, I'm too busy. I need to raise the price. And I have a lot of people, I used to, when I first started, people would ask for a discount. And, and I think they love hitting up new artists for a discount because they're so scared and they're so happy to sell something and they work you over and you just have to say, um, no, I'm working with galleries. I can't be in business with galleries and charge less. I have um, 
um, different things, but I am solid and people know they snoop, they talk, they tell people, yeah, if you talk to her, you'll get a deal. Well, they know that hardly anybody asks me for a deal unless they're a new customer. Hardly ever if they've gone, and usually it's a recommendation. So I, my value is solid. It isn't overpriced. I'm not somebody who came in and all of a sudden started selling paintings for $10,000 at a gallery because the gallery owner told me to price it that way. And then go back. You see, these there are some people putting out too high prices and they have a little bitty rush and then um, then they have to lower their price because they can't sell anything and or they're trying to sell to their friends for less or whatever because they need money that that doesn't work that makes your customers angry they think they paid too much they find out they paid too much and they're they're not gonna buy from you again you need to just stick to it and they learn and they'll come. And if it's too much the first time, they kind of get prepared for what the price is. Athena, what about you? That's a very good question. Um, well, again, I echo a lot of what um, Steve and Ellen have said. Um, and it is important to keep, um, keep an eye on the market value of your work and to keep that stable you can't be constantly moving things around. But what really helped me when I first started valuing my own work for sale was and at what um, comparable artists were doing in the galleries. So one of the advantages of being in New York is being able to go out to the galleries and look at the checklist at um, various galleries and looking at you know, looking at the age of the artist, the, the background of the artist, um, exhibition history of the artist, and to have all that information, and, you know, that was incredibly valuable for my own pricing. And then um, when I started working with uh, galleries, um, you know, learning that um, when they were able to start gauging the response to the work and pricing it, um, increasing slowly the price of the work. So um, that was really helpful to um, get an understanding about the value for me. Um, so it's just really looking around at what other artists similar to your own background are um, receiving for the work and then working with galleries um, and also knowing that even though you're working with a particular gallery if you start selling out of your own studio to make sure that those prices are stable as well so you're not undercutting you know and damaging the market value of the work um, so that was really helpful to know too and and being aware that institutions typically you know you want to they might ask for discounts and um start somewhere up to 20% discount, you know, because you think about the care that they're putting into, into the, the storage of the work and the preservation of the work. So I think we're going to look at one more question and then um, Sue, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, a couple of things. Pricing your work is incredibly personal. Um, you don't have to justify your prices to anybody. You never have to explain why you price things the way you price them. That is your decision and you can stick to your prices however you want. Um, the other thing I wanna add is you never sell your work one time. Photograph your work, get good documentation and then sell reproductions, sell stickers, sell note cards, use it as advertising for other exhibitions or new work that's coming up um, so that you create a snowball effect. I have a friend who's a printmaker and when she has studio visits and people come and they buy her work, she has stickers of old pieces. Like she just has a bowl out of stickers and every sticker is $1. And every single person who comes through, they might, maybe they buy a print, maybe they don't, but almost every single person buys a stack of stickers. And those stickers cost her maybe 10, 20 cents to produce. She sells each one for a dollar. And she, by the end of the day, sells $100 to $200 worth of stickers. 
um, and that pays for her event alone, just stickers, which is incredible, but it's brilliant. And it costs her almost zero effort to make those stickers. So you never sell your work just once. Get good documentation and sell it again and again and again. And I think Ellen has mentioned this where she makes the greeting cards, right? So greeting cards, postcards, stickers, reproductions, advertising of your work again and again. Um, and just having those different price points too is a nice way to get people who are new to collecting to get their foot in the door as well. So last question. Um, how difficult is it to sustain a career um, as an artist and at the same time raise a family or have a relationship? Well, when I first started working, I, um, I had to pay my daycare bill and that was like, I would only do like three hours of daycare and I had paint that entire time because I needed my full concentration. It, it isn't easy to do this. Um, as I get, as my kids, I don't even know how I got everything done when they were in junior high and grade school because I was driving them everywhere. And I was still creating 30 paintings a year and it seemed like it went pretty well, but it, you know, it is, um, you really have to manage your time. You really have to have a goal. You really have to protect your painting time. I had, I, I said to my kids, my time is like worth X and they would make fun of me. Oh, she says your time is worth X. But it was like, I would go, I, they'd come home from school, I'd go up there and spend immediate time with them, give them full attention, then they'd go do their homework or go goof off, whatever. And, but I didn't trust myself to paint and watch my kids. I, there's no way I could do that. I had to have that time. So that was the big thing is to protect your working time that you are not that you somehow don't let your friends make you go shopping or whatever, everything that time is yours. Malcolm, what about you? I mean, you're, I don't, yeah, you're raising, um, I don't think you're raising a family. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm not in a relationship. I, I'm not, I don't have a family um, or like kids or anything like that. Um, as an artist and the, the difficulty of trying to sustain a career, um, I'm in like my, let's see, my fifth year, I think, as an artist slash entrepreneur. So that's still very young. And so every year I've always had a handful of projects that helped me, you know, um, sustain a living in some sorts. And I also always ha um, held a part-time job in some way or another. Um, <clears throat> I guess the, the difficulties that I've had is just, um, kind of constantly learning from my, not only like my successes, but my failures. And also um, maintaining goals that I hope uh, transition into like uh, productive lifestyle choices that could help sustain and give life to my artistic career. And so having that type of um, discipline, I guess, is the only, I think, difficulty I see in sustaining and continuing my, my art career in, in some way or another. But other than that, I've, it seems as though it's been pretty laid back. <laughs> Steve? Well, um, you, did, you did that. Yeah. You know, being an artist is a, is a choice, but Making a living as an artist and raising a family is is really hard. And I've got uh, five kids who are all, you know, doing great things and uh, we're, we're empty nesters and uh, in, enjoying it. But um, you have to be uh, creative, disciplined, and prolific to uh, to to make a living and have a family. You know, you know, I've got artist friends all, all over the world. I have a friend in Bulgaria who's a sculptor. And, but he's treated like royalty in Bulgaria. Here, 
you know, we're, we're not so much, you know, and, and it's, uh, it, it, it can be frustrating um, when, um, you know, my advice to anyone watching today, if they have children, little children, is that when their skulls are full of mush at five years old, make sure you drum music and art into their little heads. Because over time, when they become adults, it'll make a difference in their lives. They may not go to art school or be, be an artist, but it will round out their lives and it will make a difference. And they may come to my art gallery and I may be dead by then, but they may come and purchase my work. You know, because we, we as a society are just not there. As, they are, as you are in Spain or France or, or Italy, where you, you, know, you are treated like royalty. You know? um, so we need to change as a society. And because we, uh, we bring a lot of value to, to the world. Uh, we bring a lot of beauty. And I think, in, especially during COVID right now, I think people are hungry for beauty. And I think the, uh, just to go back on the COVID question, I, I think that it's been kind of a blessing for us artists because, you know, for me having a studio in my backyard, I, I, can, I can be prolific. And I think selling online and uh, curbside uh, delivery at your gallery, people, people are hungry. They're hungry for beauty. And uh, that's what we're finding at, at the art gallery. So anyway, that was a long answer, but. Um, well, congratulations, congratulations on those five. Go. Thank you. Sue, you got, I think you have a creature in your house. Of, I do. Um, like a, I have, like a, I have two. I have a small five-year-old and a large 40-year-old creature. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> they are they are uh i joke that next year they have to dress up like dr evil and mini me because they really are like the small one is like a micro version of the larger one okay now, i i'm very blessed that i have a spouse who um in the evenings when i say i have to work I can come into my office and close the door and they will be outside playing cars and play-doh and whatever it is and they give me the time to um self-isolate <laughs> and do some work but ellen is right it's also um a lot of um structure and sticking to that and forcing yourself to do the work when you have to like i a friend of mine um taught me about money mondays which is um doing all the paperwork on monday when my son is in preschool so i have two and a half hours on monday morning to do all my invoices receipts my ledgers everything i have to cram it in when he's not here and that's all my paperwork for the week and everything else gets cataloged up in here until the next monday um because it's uninterrupted time and um, then you chisel away. You find two hours in the evening or on the weekend. And um, it's not ideal, but that's the reality of being a work from home mom, especially in the time of COVID. It's just the reality that it is. It's very disciplined. And um, I just hope next year he's really in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> And I can have more than five hours a week of alone time. <laughs> Athena, what's it? What's it? I don't know if you have a family, but I, I'm alone here. <laughs> so I don't. I don't have. Um, you know, I have no. I was going to say I don't have anyone to blame, but you know, I. You know, it's just me being trying to be as responsible I can as I can. So, um, um, and I, you know, I think it's it's difficult for everyone. We, I think everyone has unique situations and circumstances that they're juggling or bouncing around with. Um, you know, and um, 
you know, just to, you know, I was listening to what Steve was saying about, you know, being an artist is, you know, a choice. And, you know, there's also different aspects to that too. It's like, maybe it's not a choice because I know when I'm not in the studio and I'm not doing my work, I know I'm miserable and I know I'm cranky and moody. Um, and so I'm going, well, you know, how much of a choice is that? <laughs> you know, being, having a good quality um, life where you're expressing yourself and your environment and the human experience or you're doing whatever else you can. So I think, you know, it, it is important. And, um, you know, Ellen or Sue talking about carving out that time and uh, making sure that you have that fixed time for yourself and what you need to do and protecting that working time. Um, that's important too, but I feel like my schedule is always, it's all over the place. Um, and it's, you know, responding to everyone's, uh, responding to all the different various interests that comes in, you know, whether that's a Zoom meeting or a phone call, a business meeting about projects coming, um, and then staying on top of it all. Um, it is good if you could have like a regular schedule to keep things moving, but, um, you know, it's, it's everything. I think it's always complicated because you're constantly growing and expanding and you're, you're, everything shifts. So you do your best to shift and respond to those, those, um, that evolution. Well, I'm, I'm going to turn this over to Savannah. I, if there are some questions that have come in, um, Savannah. Hi, everyone. Um, it doesn't actually look like we have had any questions in the chat, but I would like to open that up to anybody who's listening. If you'd like to either submit them in the chat or the Q&A button, you are welcome to now. So, uh, so with our resident philosopher in attendance with Andy, um, I, I thought I'd give him an opportunity to summarize. What what have we just experienced, Andrew? If you, uh, if you could if you could put in a of uh, the resident philosopher. Yeah. Uh, okay. I I'll, I'll take that. I mean, it's better than other things. I suppose I could be called, but I think that's uh, uh probably. I would, yeah. I would love to be the resident philosopher. I always think of myself that way. Um, <laughs> you know, it it. Uh, I, I think this is a really wonderfully diverse group of artists um, that you gathered because uh, it, it sounds to me like none of their experiences were, have been the same, right? And that's basically, I think, you know, I, when I think about um, the adaptability of, of artists to, um, to fit into, to do their work and to, um, to fit into the economic pressures and the family pressures and the current environment and understanding, the, um, the locations and their conditions, um, I think artists are the ideal entrepreneurs um, because it, it really requires that kind of like, um, that adaptability, which is, uh, which is, I think, to be admired, which is why I think um, artists are also great um, in the workplace when they are, um, when they're, as Sue said, if they're pursuing something that feeds their mouth, they're usually pretty good at that too because those are transferable skills to um, to many to many work environments outside of studio practice, and so um, I just think um, sorry I've just been really enjoying the um, the responses the getting to know a little bit more about these um, these artists and their different circumstances. But um, I, I would say um, yeah that uh, artists artists are really wonderful. Um, entrepreneurs they're um, and they're not always thought of in that way so that's why I was glad that we chose this topic um, I think artists are um, perhaps pigeonholed or um, thought of in a certain way that is out that is divorced from reality um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying Athena you, you must know what I'm saying like people might have some idea of what your studio practice and what your life is like oh, through know. your through your work or through the idea of what they think you are um, uh, but then there's the reality of what you're doing, right? Which is building wonderful relationships with museums, building good relationships with collectors, having some good and some really terrible relationships with gallerists, 
um, lecturing, teaching, doing residencies, responding to every opportunity you can, you can get. And sometimes what it looks like are those brown um, files that you have <laughs> beside you, which is, which is like, you know, which I assume is your office, but I have no idea. It's like, you know, it's, it's, um, it's lived experience, which is way more complicated than we sometimes um, imagine it to be. So, so we do have a question, and, and I'd like a one-word answer from each of you. Have you produced more work or sold more work during COVID as opposed to non-pre-COVID? Steve? More. Pasteur? Less. Athena? Equal. Ellen? More. Sue? Produced less, sold more. Falcon? More, definitely more. Wow, wow. Uh, there's another question and uh, this will be it and I think we'll close off. We did say an hour and a half. I thought we would shut this down at about 40 minutes, but uh, it, I, I think it was a, a really uh, informative session and uh, I'm looking forward to doing it again. Um, how has Minnesota and North Dakota made readily uh, made resources available to empower artists' monumental contribution to our population, population's well-being, um, and our uh, sensory experiences? Um, I can I can tell you that Minnesota does a hell of a lot better job than North Dakota, having uh, been the development director at. Uh, Rochester Art Center in, in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, the Minnesota State Arts Board is phenomenal. Uh, it has a constitutional amendment that makes it a, requires it to be funded to a certain level. Um, and that organization gets incredible resources out to throughout the state, you know, from, from Grand Marais to Farmington to uh, Moorhead to uh, Winona, you know, Andy and I were the beneficiaries of that when we were, when we both worked in, in Minnesota. North Dakota, not so much. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it's taking uh, a long time uh, to get the state and, and, and other organizations in, in, the, in the state to realize, as Steve said, the, the value of the artists. We need to be, we need to be putting artists uh, a little higher on the uh, on the, the ladder. Um, with that, um, can, I, can I add something? Sure. Just because I'm Minnesota girl, I want to piggyback off what you said. Um, the Minnesota State Arts Board has also recognized um, communities outside of the Twin Cities area as being an underrepresented community and has made a push. Um, to uh, try to get more grant funding to those communities, especially with their community outreach programs and their grant funding specifically for um, underrepresented communities. So not just um, urban minority groups, but also when they say underrepresented communities, they mean basically any community outside of the um, major metro area of the Twin Cities, which is, yeah. A pretty yeah, one of the things paper. that Minnesota has is uh, regional art, art uh, councils. I think there are 13 of them um, and they get about 50% of the funding that's made available in Minnesota. So if, if you're a Minnesota artist listening in on this conversation, uh, please take a look at um, what the MSAB is available. They do fund individual artists, they, they fund tours, they fund organizations. Uh, they, they fund emerging artists, so please take advantage of that. Um, I just got a note uh, that my sister's watching this. So that's kind of cool. She's in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, Can I add something, uh, Sandy? Sure. Uh, back in 1970, after high school, my parents uh, came to me and they were prepared to, to send me to NDSU if I wanted to go to college. And so they asked me, what, what do you think your major would be? And I said, well, I think the only thing that I could pass would be art. And I'll never forget this. They looked at each other and they looked back at, at me and they said, I don't think so. 
And so I never, I never did go to college because they weren't prepared to, to send me to school to, to, uh, to learn art. And I wonder how, if that's even changed today. If, if a young if a person out of high school goes to their parents and they say, well, what's, what's your major going to be? And they say art, you know, has that changed in 50 years? I don't think it has. I'll say I taught, I'm still teaching at the university and uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, it's about 50-50 now, I think, where parents are sort of like, let's see what happens. But I had the same experience I won't age myself, but a few decades ago, I took my parents, I wanted to be a graphic designer originally. And I took my parents to the grocery store to explain to them what graphic design was. And I remember standing in the cereal aisle saying, everything here was designed and they still didn't get it. And then in college, I switched to photography and they were so excited because they knew how much they paid for my senior portraits. And they're like, okay, you'll be fine. We know how expensive <laughs> photography is. And then of course I said, oh no, I'm never doing that. <laughs> So, yeah, but it's still the same thing where I have students coming in as freshmen and they're terrified that they won't make, they won't survive because they have to go back to their parents and, and try to explain to them how they can make a living as an artist. So uh, I, I, I want to close with, a, with an Ellen story. Uh, it's on her website, so I'm not, I'm not taking anything out of context, but when Ellen was a kid and showed promise as an artist, um, to pay for her very first, am I getting this right? Your very first art lessons? Work you guys step. lived on a farm, so they sold a cow. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's too cool. Can I add something, Sandy? I just, um, in Minnesota, they have real, what are called fine art fairs. And in North Dakota, they try to have a fine art fair and they, um, fill it up with booze selling crafty junk. I mean, it, just to get more money. And this is the prime area of educating the public where they can come into a comfortable environment and see art and meet artists. But when you go, the artists don't wanna go do these shows because there's no market they say, or there's nothing, but people are going there to buy stuff and food and that's like, the whole goal and it seems like why, why can't we get something that's really gradually builds and good but you know you have to get the artists to respond and I, I think that's somehow one way we could build something in North Dakota for the art. Well with that um, I want to thank all of you um, for first of all agreeing to do this and for sharing um, a lot of really good information as well as stories and feelings. Um, and you know, we'll do this again. Uh, I'm not sure when. Um, our next art and business uh, breakfast slash brunch is scheduled for March. Um, Savannah, Sarah, and I haven't figured out what that's going to be yet, but uh, we seem to be uh, coming up with some pretty good ideas. Um, but again, thank you for participating uh, with Art, um, and we'll see you down the road. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great. Nice to meet all of you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh -huh.